All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. So welcome to uh, session three of hack of oh, sorry stack school not hack school <laughs> um this week we're covering servers and apis which is a pretty big topic so hopefully we do it justice um i'm anar this is sachin we're gonna be presenting today so yeah let's get into it Ooh. so here's what we're gonna be talking about today i'm not gonna read it but you are welcome to if you would like by the way these slides there's a link to them on the discord so check that out um but yeah if you enjoy reading, I recommend checking out this QR code. Um, it is a link to um, our GitHub README. Um, just basically all the content that we're going to talk about today uh, is written up here, if you prefer that. Uh, we also have a PDF version uh, here on the left. There's a link right there if you prefer pretty format PDF. All right. And before we get into the actual content, just some quick announcements. So um, first of all, very exciting. We have Hack on the Hill um, this uh, March, Sunday, March 5th. Uh, it is a 12 hour beginner friendly hackathon where you will be able to flex all of the skills that you learn here at this workshop series and potentially learn new ones. And you'll also have a great opportunity to learn or to win prizes and meet new people. So. If you are interested in a hackathon, in a beginner-friendly hackathon, uh, scan this application uh, QR code. It'll take you to a Google, sorry, a Google form, um, and you can fill that out and apply. All right. Another thing, um, so ACM Board, um, our mother branch, <laughs> um, asked us to tell you to fill out the census. Um, Basically, they just want to know the demographics that come out to our events. Um, so if you want to do that, you can do that. If I think there's going to be a raffle. So if you're interested, then definitely check that out. QR code again. Um, I think it's pretty quick, so it shouldn't take up too much of your time. All right. And one final thing. So uh, just a reminder about tokens. Um, normally, they look like this on the top right. Um, but we kind of forgot them. We don't have them this week. So <laughs> instead, they're going to look like a loose leaf uh, sheet of paper that has something written on them. I don't know what James is drawing. Oh, so they have the hack logo on them. That's what they're going to look like this week. But um, if you've been coming the last two weeks, you know that um, if you participate, if you ask a question or you answer a question, uh, then we will give you a token. And tokens are good for prizes, right? So uh, any one of these prizes up here, uh, if you get the most tokens today in this workshop, you can take your pick, whatever you like. Uh, I know Nathan likes avocado. Um, turtle, tortoise is pretty cool too. I don't know what this is. I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe an alligator, whatever. Um, yeah, so definitely participate. And even further than that, actually, we have grand prizes for the top three most earned tokens in the quarter. So these are the grand prizes <laughs> up here. Uh, placed or position three gets this duck squish mellow. I'm not sure if that's set in stone, actually, but probably. Um, place two gets this very cute, very polite looking seal. Um, <laughs> Personally, I would really like this seal. Like, I kind of want to buy it just on my own, um, regardless of like stack school. Um, so yeah, that is place two. Position one gets this massive four foot tall teddy bear, um, which is kind of cool. <laughs> if you like um, kindergartner size teddy bears, um, then definitely participate. Uh, try to get the most tokens throughout the whole quarter. Um, and yeah, so any questions on that? Uh, actually, I do want to say before I go on, please come see us at the end. Um, otherwise, we have no way of knowing how many tokens you got. <laughs> right. So like we need to record how many you got. Someone's going to be up here probably with a computer taking your names and your um, your emails and then also how many tokens you have. Um, and yeah. If you don't do that, we can't give you a prize. So <laughs> please come see us if you get any tokens. 
All right. Without further ado, let's get started with the actual content. So uh, I think we could start with a workshop on servers, right? Um, that seems pretty intuitive. Um, so there's a lot of misunderstanding here. Uh, I have a feeling if you ask, you know, if you got like 10 people off the street and you ask each of them the question, what is a server? Uh, they've all probably heard of servers. Like they, they maybe have seen them in movies or TV shows, whatever. Um, but they wouldn't be able to tell you concretely what it is, right? Um, and one way that I like to think of them is as black boxes. So we have a, oh, it's my laser pointer. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, <laughs> we have a black box here. Um, yeah, if you don't know, a black box is basically just something that you give stuff to. It does some computation behind the scenes. You don't know exactly what it does. And then it spits out something back at you, right? So you give it some input, it gives you some output, but you don't necessarily know how it works, right? And in the case of a server, you can use them as black boxes to process and retrieve information, right? So it makes it really easy um, as consumers of servers, right? Like think about just something as simple as a Google search um <laughs> it would be pretty annoying if you had to know the intricacies of how servers worked every time you tried to make a google search right like that would be not fun so luckily we don't have to do that and by the way uh when i was making these slides uh, i happened upon this cute uh google boba game so i just want to show you <laughs> um what it is i thought it was very and like these animals come and approach you um and make over for fun very satisfying really very calm listen to that sound anyway you can play that there's a link to the slides i'm not going to waste any more time though <laughs> um yeah so it's really great uh that we can think of servers as black boxes um makes it really easy for us as consumers Right, but we wanna make our own, right? We're full stack developers. We wanna dig a little deeper and have a deeper understanding of what a server is um, beyond that. So let's try to do that. Um, so asking once again, our uh, uh, burning question, what is a server? Um, it's literally just a computer, right? Like just a computer. Uh, but that's not the most satisfying answer, right? Like we can't tell the difference between these two computers. I'll say that one of them is a server, one of them is not. Does anyone wanna to try to guess uh, which of these is a server? It's, there's literally no way to tell, but if you guess right, I will throw you one of these. Anybody guess? No, one of them is a server. <laughs> so guess which one. Yes. Correct. <laughs> All right, which one, what, what would you like? Any preferences? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll probably go with a random one. Okay, um, in that case, I give you this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Um, yeah, so here's our server on the right. Um, we can't yet tell the difference between it and this other computer. I'm gonna give this other computer a name, just an arbitrary name, doesn't really matter. I'm gonna call it a client, right? Again, name doesn't really matter. Um, I could call it like Tim if I wanted to. Um, but this client computer has something that it wants to accomplish, right? It has some tasks that's it, that it wants to perform. Um, and it knows that the server can accomplish those tasks in a efficient way, right? So it's going to send something called a request to the server. Um, and uh, the server then is gonna listen out for that request. It's gonna hear it, and then it's going to try to fulfill it, right? Um, once it can, or once it fulfills that request, once it does like whatever computation behind the scenes, it'll send something called a response back to our client um, that contains maybe some data, um, some metadata about how the request went, stuff like that. 
Um, and that's literally all that distinguishes a server from a normal computer is that the server is listening out for requests, right? That's the only thing that makes it a server, right? Cool, so just to summarize, a computer, or sorry, a server is a computer that we task with listening and responding to requests. Uh, that can be a request for data or to perform some task. Um, and these requests are gonna come from other computers that we like to call clients. Um, going back to this last slide, we call this relationship the client server model, if you care. Um, just a fancy term for uh, what's going on here. Um, and uh, just to bring us back to our uh, restaurant analogy that we've been bringing up a couple times um, in the past couple weeks. Um, <clears throat> so you can think of this guy, this customer here. Um, he sat down to eat. He wants, he's really hungry. He wants to order some food. Uh, we can think of him as the client, right? <clears throat> and these two, this waitress, and somewhere back here is the kitchen. Uh, we can think of them both as part of the server, right? So the client is going to request, make a request for some food. The server is going to take that request, go behind the scenes back to the kitchen, make some food, and bring it back uh, in response to our client's request, right? Cool. So um, this guy and this lady, they have a common language, right? They both speak English. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to understand each other. Maybe they don't speak English. Maybe they're like in, I don't know, Paris. They're speaking France or they're speaking French. Um, but the point is that they have a common language, right? And we need that also for our client and our server. They need a common language in order to be able to understand each other. Um, and we're gonna call that a protocol. Um, so in this case, I mean, there are many different protocols. In this case, we're gonna use something called HTTP, which you've probably heard of before. It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, right? And here's an example of an HTTP request. Um, you might be like at first glance, you're like, what the, like, why are you showing me this? Like, it looks not fit for human consumption. Um, but there are some things that are pretty useful to understand about it. Uh, in particular, I want to point out uh, this thing right here in this red circle. Um, oh, you can see my cursor. That would have been good to know when I brought this, uh, <laughs> this laser pointer. Anyway, um, you can see this thing right here, this keyword get, um, this is an HTTP request method. Uh, and basically what it indicates is um, that we wanna get some data from our client, right? And that's what request methods are gonna do for us. They're gonna tell us, sorry, they're gonna tell the server what we want to accomplish, right? Um, and I'll cover this all once again, so don't worry if you don't get it quite yet. Um, here's another thing. Uh, uh, the request endpoint uh, includes both this get keyword and this slash here. It's basically indicating where on our server we want to direct our request to, right? So in this case, it is the top level because it's just a slash, right? Also, don't worry about this HTTP thing here. It's not part of this. It's just a separate thing. Um, but yeah, so this just indicates to our server where we should direct our request. And finally, we have our host field here. Uh, this is going to be where we put our server address. In this case, it's w, <laughs> www.example.com. Um, but usually during development, it's going to be localhost 8080. That's just by convention. Uh, that indicates our own computer. OK. <clears throat> and just to uh, give you some more examples of request methods. We have this get thing that we talked about here. Again, that's just a request to get some data uh, from our server. We also have something called post. Uh, that is a request that will update the state of the server in some way by sending data from the client to the server. So we're uploading data from our client um, to our server. And then we also have something called put. Um, that is gonna update the status of an existing resource on our server. Okay, so think if there's like, you know, we have posts stored on our server, we wanna like a post, right? 
Yes. I am on Google Slides. Yeah, but that's like, that's lame. You know, this is so much more organic. Look at this, right? Like you, you can, you're, you're with me, you know? <laughs> um, but thank you for pointing that out. Give them a token, why not? Um, yes, so like I said, put is just gonna update the, sta the, the status of an existing resource, right? And we have one final one. Uh, it is delete. It's pretty intuitively named, just a request to delete a resource, right? Any questions about request methods? Pretty clear. Cool. <clears throat> and we have a lot more. Oh yes, what's up? Okay, yeah. I was expecting that question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so post. Okay, the difference is that put is called idempotent. That's like a property of put. That basically just means that put will have the same effect no matter what. It doesn't depend on outside aspects uh, in the server. Does that make sense? So post, um, it can depend on things outside of like the thing is trying to update. So it might not have the same result every time we make the same post request. Right, so put, for example, like I said, the posts, like if there's posts on a server and we wanna like it, um, that would be a good example of a put request because we're just liking the post and it doesn't depend on anything outside the server, or uh, sorry, outside that post. It's just dependent on that one thing. Post on the other hand, um, could depend on, like, say we want to, um, I don't know, change the number of likes to the number of users in our database, right? <laughs> users could change, potentially, and that will have a different effect every time we call post. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that question. That was a good question. Um, and we have many more uh, request methods besides these. I did just want, I just wanted to focus on these four because like um, they're gonna be the most pertinent to us here, but you can check out, there's a link here. You can check out more if you would like. Um, and just to summarize once again, uh, we have our method, which is gonna indicate what your request will do. Um, so that's something like get, post, put, delete, like I just showed you. Um, and we also have our uh, endpoint and our host, um, that's just indicating where it's gonna get done, right? So we have, again, one example of an endpoint is git slash profile. Um, this, for example, indicates that we wanna get some profile information from our server, right? Uh, and it's gonna be located at the at slash profile on the server. And for our host, it just indicates our server address. Uh, it could be something like localhost 8080. Um, but what happens next, right? Like what, once the request is formed and sent, where do we go from there? Does anyone have any ideas? So the request has been sent to the server. Now what? Exactly. We're going to make a response. Um, so you can see here, the server's going to send a response back. Um, and a response looks something like this. Um, it looks pretty similar to our HTTP requests, right? Um, so uh, a couple key differences, but we'll, we'll go through those when we need to. For now, I do want to dial back a little bit and look at this at a higher level. So we want to talk about the anatomy of an HTTP message. So a message encompasses both a request and a response, right? So everything that I say right here, right now, is gonna to apply to both of them. Um, so we're dissecting our, our friend Kermit here, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we have our, um, every HTTP message is gonna contain a, something called a head. And that looks something like this from our previous example. This is just the head. Uh, and our head contains meta information 
about the message. So stuff like um, when was the message sent, the date, uh, how long is the message, uh, the content length, stuff like that. That's all going to be in our head, right? Uh, and we also have something called the body, uh, which is any data associated with the message. So uh, in our previous example, that was the HTML stuff that we saw there. Um, and that could be literally any data type. It could be HTML. In a lot of cases, it's going to be JSON. Does anyone remember what JSON is from last time? JSON, anybody? Man, really? The first letter is JavaScript, stands for JavaScript. Yes. Yes, and what is it? What is it used for? Like, what is it? Okay, good enough. <laughs> Someone, yeah. Um, basically, it is a way to encode a JavaScript object as a string. Right. Does that make sense? This makes it easier to pass it in our HTTP messages. All right. So we're going to do that a lot. Um, yes. Cool. So just remember that every message has both a head and a body. Um, and the head is meta information. The body is data associated with the message. All right. Oh, and I do want to point out this thing right here. Uh, this 200 OK. Um, this is something called an HTTP status code um, and basically indicates that the request was OK, right? It was successful. Everything that needed to happen on both the client and server side happened and nothing went wrong and we we're very happy. Um, so yeah, any message, sorry, any status code starting with two and then any number there uh, is going to indicate success. And then we have a bunch of other ones, um, kind of a lot. <laughs> Let's just focus on 400 and 500. So 400 indicates a client error, right? That means that um, you know the client made a syntax mistake. Maybe they tried to um, access something that doesn't exist, stuff like that. Um, and then the 500 uh, status code is gonna indicate a server error. That means the client did everything they could but something went wrong on the server side, maybe like, you know, hard drive got filled up and they couldn't post any more data um, or could, they couldn't download any more data, right? And uh, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to like just memorize all this. I mean, you can, I guess, but don't, like there's no point in memorizing it. Just like as you use it, you'll start to get more comfortable um, and it'll start to be like such a second nature. Um, does anyone, speaking of second nature, does anyone have, has anyone remembered, like, what is a common status code that you've probably seen, like somewhere in a browser? Um, yes, exactly, 404. Do you know what 404 means? Yeah, perfect. So 404 happens when um, we try to navigate to a browser page. Um, sorry, a website page, and that page doesn't exist, right? So it just means that that resource wasn't found on the server, the client made a mistake, it's a 404 error. All right. Um, so before I go on, any questions about anything? Anything that's not clear? Yeah. If it's a 200, then yeah. Oh, that is a good question, actually. I don't know. What would it say if it wasn't a 200? Where is it? I assume something like error. I don't know for sure, but um, yeah, something like that. Error, bad request. There you go. Um, cool, any other questions? Awesome. Okay, so let's go back to our restaurant. Um, so we have a common language now. Uh, the customer, sorry, the client and the server, they both speak HTTP, right? Um, but we have a deeper problem, which is that 
how does the client know what they can get from the server, right? Like, if you think about, like, if you're a customer at a restaurant, um, how do you know what you can order? Like, you can't just order anything. Like, if you're at, like, a, like a vegan restaurant, you can't order chicken. Like, that wouldn't be um, good. <laughs> uh, so, does anyone, what would we need in the restaurant analogy? What do we have? Yeah. A recipe? A menu, yeah, there you go. So we have a menu, right? And the analog to this in our server client model is something called an API, right? Uh, an API stands for Application Programming Interface, uh, which doesn't really matter, but uh, there you go. Um, it's a way for two computers to interact with each other, right? So in this case, the client and server, they wanna interact, they use the API to do so. Oh, sorry, to be more specific, the the server's API to do so. Um, and you can think of APIs as like an umbrella term. It contains many different things. One of those things is something very important to us, which is web APIs. Uh, and what makes an API a web API is just that it communicates using HTTP messages, right? Um, and all of these APIs, all of these web APIs are gonna contain uh, a bunch of endpoints that indicate what the server can do for the client, right? Um, so, you know, for example, if we consider this menu here, this Boba menu as a as an API, we can get milk tea, taro, medium, right? It just indicates that we can get that from the server. Okay. Um, any any questions before we move on? Cool. So, I'm gonna, get Sachin up here and he's gonna talk about an example. All right, cool. So I've gone ahead and implemented an API. And what we're, gonna, what we're essentially gonna do is look at the interactions with it, and then we're gonna go and implement our own together. So before we look at uh, kind of interacting with an API, let's kind of try to think about what an API for interacting with a cat would look like. So in this example, think back to like the menu example, but like what a menu would be if you had like a physical cat. Uh, if you own a cat, this may, might be a little easier. So um, what kind of things do you do with like a pet cat? Does anyone have a cat first off? Okay, cool. Do you know, what do you, what do, you do with your cat? Okay, cool. I don't think we have an endpoint for that, but next time maybe. Um, what, what else do you do with your cat? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. You could feed your cat, yeah. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna to give tokens to these folks? Or? <gasps> oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. You could pet your cat. You could feed your cat. Yeah. Um. So let's go ahead and see which ones I've actually implemented here. Uh, feeding it, giving it a drink, petting it, um, just checking up on it, and then meowing at it. So um, for each of these kind of five endpoints, um, we're going to need a request type, uh, like Anna was talking about. So I've listed the kind of four main ones up here. Um, so for, let's just talk about this first one, feeding the cat. Um, what type of request do you guys think this might be? If I want to feed the cat, which one can it not be? Or which one can it be? Yeah, go ahead. Post, okay. Yeah, I think that's what we decided to go with. Um, I feel like if you say put, you could get away with it here um, because this is a very simple API. Uh, it's not very clear what's happening behind the scenes, but yeah, post is what we went with. And um, you'll find that giving the cat a drink will be very similar, so we went with post. Uh, petting the cat, again, is, is something you're, you're kind of giving to the uh, server, so that's also post. Um, and this one at the bottom here, again, the same logic is post. Uh, what about this fourth one here, checking up on how the cat is doing? What kind of a request might that be? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly, get request. Because you're just getting something from the server. You don't, you're not giving it any data. You just want to get some information. OK. And then um, on the far right here, those are the kind of second part of the uh, request endpoints or request types or whatever the terminology AI used um, that we're going to look at. So um, essentially, I just simplified it to a single word so that it's pretty short. OK. Um, do I need to press escape first? Three fingers, OK. <laughs> So um, yeah, uh, before we actually go ahead and test the endpoints out, 
Um, one thing that I will say is that I'm using a, uh, an extension to Visual Studio Code, and we're going to talk through kind of downloading that. Um, but what you need to know is that um, basically what this extension allows us to do is create a file with the .oest extension, and then in that file, we can write, write our requests and then send them. So let's just look at this the first two lines here at the top. What you can see is that we have a get request at the endpoint slash status, um, and then we have the protocol, and then we have the host specified. So the host is specified as localhost 8080, like Anor said, um, just because the server is running locally on our computer. So we don't need to like, go over the internet or anything. We can just uh, look at uh, port 8080. So if I run the server, before we actually test it out, does, does the setup make sense? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, all we need to do with this Visual Studio Code extension is just like, write up our request, which are those two lines there, and then click Send Request. And, okay, uh, the colors are a little bit, they kind of blend in a little bit, but uh, let me see if I just highlight it. Does that work maybe? Can I do that? Yeah, maybe you should try. Um, but basically, um, you can see the request was, oh, yeah. I guess that's marginally better. Um, the request is here, and uh, at the top, we have our header, and at the bottom, the box. So let's look at the, the header first. Um, basically, we have the uh, protocol that's being used, and then a little bit further down, we have the, the response code, and it says OK. Um, what does the 200 response code mean? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I saw someone give a, give a thumbs up. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and then uh, I guess we can kind of skip past the rest of the header information and look at the body here. So um, this body is using that, that JavaScript, the JSON syntax. Um, and basically, it's uh, just kind of giving us some details about our text. So it's health, hunger, search, whatever that means. And then uh, um, the action that the cat is currently doing. So I guess it's it wants. Um, Sitting down, ready for more pets. So um, let's go ahead and look at the pet request then, except, yeah, here it is, um, and see what that kind of looks like. So what are some of the differences between this uh, request and the get request at the top there? Kind of give you a hint, is what I said. So what makes this request distinct from this request? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and for, for all purposes, that, that doesn't really change anything because uh, we literally just change one word and then change the endpoint. Um, but um, as you'll see when we do our other demo, where we're actually making it ourselves, um, post requests, uh, I guess the implementation is slightly different. Okay, so let's go ahead and send this request. And, uh, okay, so like this colored thing is kind of making it a little bit difficult. <laughs> I'll be honest. Can you highlight it again? Sorry, I don't. Yeah, I mean, you just like, uh -huh. highlight it like you would anything else. Just it's a press uh -huh. down hard. Okay. Yeah. Wait. My bad. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, what you might notice is that it looks like it didn't really change, right? But um, if you think of this context field here, um, it actually will would have updated or will have updated. Um, uh, yeah, the time zone is not safe. Um, but uh, basically, it just wants more text. So that's why the message is still the same. Um, so that's something that you can see does change in the header to know that your request is actually uh, being sent and you're uh, receiving a new, a new uh, uh, response. OK, so any questions on those two endpoints before we quickly test the other ones out? OK, cool. So let's go ahead and try feeding the cat. And we can see. You can try to see that um, it's eating the food, and um, this actually updated something about the state of the cat, the hunger uh, increase. So if we get the status again, we should see, yeah, that the um, the hunger is still like the the state of the server has been changed by right, by our post request, which is kind of uh, some of the underlying reason behind like the underlying reasoning behind using a server is that you can kind of have clients interact with that server in a way that that um, basically kind of persists so that um, instead of just a client being by themselves, they can uh, actually have some, some sort of effect that um, they can see later on. 
Okay, and then for completeness, we'll go ahead and try the water one. Um, and the cat here is just drinking. And again, it's updating the post. Okay, so any questions on this kind of brief demo before we talk, take a look at how we're going to go ahead and implement our server? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so how, are you asking how I implemented the server or how I implemented the requests? Yeah, so the requests right now are just using this kind of general syntax here, which is more or less standardized. There may be like some slight differences, uh, but this is just, uh, it's, it follows the kind of REST protocol, REST, um, I guess, API syntax. So, yeah, go ahead. Yes, and we're going to do it together, so you'll see that, like, happening live. Okay, great. Let's switch back. Okay, this is the extension thing. Um, we'll double back to this. Uh, okay, so let's talk about how we're going to actually implement our server. Uh, again, we're kind of following the Moon tech stack. So does anyone remember what Moon stands for? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so out of those technologies, uh, which might you want to use for a server? This is just anyone or you, or you again, I guess. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, expressed is one of them and uh, node would be the other one. And I, I'm not really expecting you guys to know that. So we're going to talk through why those are the two that we're going to be using here. Um, so to kind of motivate that, let's try to think about what Node actually is. So um, I think this is the definition that Node defines for itself and that James gave in the first workshop. Um, and it basically says, Node is an asynchronous, event-driven JavaScript runtime designed to build scalable network applications. So we're just going to go through some of the kind of keywords there and just uh, look at what that means and why that's important to have. For a server. So um, the first one here is asynchronous. Uh, the kind of folks that did the workshop last week talked a lot about that. So do you, does anyone remember what asynchronous means or like what asynchronous programming is? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, essentially, it just means that the code does not need to run sequentially. So yeah, you can basically um, uh, have, like, have multiple tasks going at the same time uh, because you don't need to wait for one task to finish uh, to do the second one. So as an example of that, let's just say like back with our cat example, our cat takes like a full hour to eat its meal. Um, so if we send a request to feed the cat and then we tried to pet it, the pet request would basically um, be blocked until the, um, the feed request is, being, is like finished being handled, right? Until the cat is finished eating. So that would kind of, that would hinder, I guess, us really using our server to handle multiple requests. Um, and I guess this, this diagram here is, is supposed to illustrate that. You can see with like separate requests. Cool. All right. uh, oh, shoot, whoops. Hopefully you didn't see that. Um, Event-driven. Uh, what do you guys think event-driven means? Like in the context of, of the computing, I guess. Or otherwise. Well, what is an event? Like if someone, if maybe someone could just define the word for me generally, like not, not even in the context of computing. Sure, yeah. A get request could be an event. Um, uh, but I would just say that if you had to define an event generally, it would just be something that's happening. Right. Um, so if, if something is event driven, that means that um, it's basically being the result of, of an event happening. Right. So um, node being an event driven JavaScript runtime basically uh, means that it's really good at listening for these events and handling them. So some examples of these events would be like a, uh, an HTTP request, right? So like an API call. Um, so like the get the get uh, status um, post the water, 
um, those are all kind of requests that a node would be great at handling. Um, and you also see that we're going to use node for our front end um, because uh, it's really good at listening for those events. So for example, if you click your mouse, um, that could also be considered an event. Um, and uh, basically node is going to help us uh, listen for that and then handle it. Okay, so it's also described as a runtime. I'm going to run through this one. Um, basically what that means is that it's just a runtime environment. So somewhere where we can run our JavaScript code. Um, and this just allows us to write our JavaScript code and then mm -hmm. run it and actually have something happen um, in like a known kind of environment. Okay. Um, so Node is also described as being scalable. Uh, what do you guys think that means? There's a hint with the image. Also. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, what do you mean by nodes? Okay. No, no, I, I think just generally, yeah, that, that's fair. Um, when you, uh, if you're trying to scale something up and down, um, for example, if like, let's just say I have an integer, right? And I want to scale that integer up. Um, generally, I would just kind of multiply it by some value. Uh, I guess that's more of kind of a mathematical interpretation. Um, in the context of like uh, servers and web, web applications in general, um, scalability just refers to how well your um, uh, server or I guess computer can like um, uh, handle like small amounts of work and large amounts of work. So basically at like 1 a.m. Or, or 3 a.m. or whatever, when like there's only one person on our, um, our app, we want it to, to work like very well. Um, but we also want it to work well um, like during the day when there are like thousands of people using our app. Um, so basically we want our, our app to kind of efficiently uh, allocate more resources and, and deallocate resources. Uh, so, and this is going to happen behind the scenes. But uh, basically, it, it should be able to handle uh, like uh, whether like a small number of people are using our server or a large number of people are using our server. Okay. Uh, and then the last one here is network applications. So um, why might it be important for Node to be good for network applications? And what what generally might a network application be? So if we just kind of break the word down, um, network here is more or less just referring to the internet, like net, and then application is just like an application generally. It's some sort of software or, or um, uh, I guess program that we're running. So uh, Node being good for network applications just means that it's really good for de de developing these kind of web applications that we want to run on some sort of kind of co uh, a computer in the cloud or like a server. And then we want to kind of access from our own kind of clients. So it's good for that client server model. That Anna was talking about. Okay, before I move on to um, Express, which will be faster than this, uh, any questions on Node? Okay. Um, so yeah, Express here, um, it's defined as a minimal and flexible Node.js framework that provides a robust set of features for web applications. So um, the keyword, like that's kind of a lot, right? But the, the keyword there is just that it's a Node.js framework. Um, and that all that really means is that it's just a collection of codes, so like a, um, I guess, similar to like a, a library um, that uh, just sits on top, like runs uh, on top of Node.js. So it's, it's basically just a JavaScript library, so just some JavaScript code. Um, and a common use for Express is designing APIs, which means that they have like functions that are uh, very kind of like tailored towards designing an API. And that basically means that instead of writing like 10 lines of code, we can just write one line of code. So it just makes it a little easier to, to, to uh, write these APIs. Okay, any questions on Express then? Okay. Okay, nice. So let's hop back to the, um, uh, the um, extension here. So this is the way to kind of get the extension. Um, you want to click this, these like four boxes here. Let me also switch back to it. And then um, in the search bar that comes up here, you'll want to type in REST client. And it should be this first one here um, that has the blue circle. Let me also close this. 
should look something like this. And then where it says disable here, there should be a blue button that says install. That's what you want to press. Does anyone have, is anyone having any issues with that? Okay, and once you install that, what that's essentially gonna allow you to do is create that .rest file that, that I, was, I was working with, and then um, actually uh, like write those two lines or three lines that sends the request. And we're gonna do it together. Okay, so um, there we go. Um, so this is the code that we were looking at last time. Um, let me also pull up. And um, all we've changed here is remove the bottom couple lines that uh, Nathan added that were creating a, a, a post every time we ran the server. Um, so uh, go ahead and remove anything after line 17 if you were following along or have cloned um, the, the currently updated uh, repository. Uh, but make sure you include this line 16 here because we're going to be using our posts schema. We're going to be kind of creating uh, endpoints so that users can create these new posts. So we need the schema. OK, so um, does anyone need me to pause before I go on with the demo? OK, um, so now what we're going to do is basically add Express to our um, server.js file here. So to do that, we need to add a line at the top. This line will be const, uh, const express equals require express, essentially just including express. And then what we're going to need to do is add a couple lines at the bottom here. Um, technically, I guess we could put, let's put them here. Um, so this is going to say const app equals express. So this is basically just initializing ex an instance of express. Um, and then we're going to say app.use express.json. So what this line here is doing is it's saying um, when I'm uh, getting a request, like when I'm receiving information, format it in the JSON form. And then we need to add a line that says app.listen. Uh, and then, so this listen function takes in two parameters. You can see there, it says the first parameter is port. So that's going to be 8080, like uh, you know mentioned. And then the second parameter here, uh, we're not going to be using this overload. We're going to, um, it's just going to be a function, basically, that says, um, so once I've I'm done setting this up, what do I do? So this is just going to be, uh, we're going to use an arrow function, um, like we talked about in, in past weeks. Uh, and this is just going to say uh, console.log. Um, oh uh, listening on port 80, 80 like that. So all that line is doing is saying that I'm going to listen on port 8080 and then print this out when I'm done. Okay. And um, what we can do now is basically just test it out. Um, so I'm just going to change this single quote here. And then if we type in uh, yarn start, okay, the file is, should be saved. Um, let's see. So it looks like it's giving me an error there. Um, and uh, it basically says could not find package.json file. So what that means is that it tried to run, it tried to run the yarn start, but then um, it couldn't find like any yarn basically uh, or any of the dependencies. So if we type in ls here, um, it's kind of small. Let's make this a little larger. Basically, we can see that uh, it's not, it doesn't want to go larger. Um, the directory here is, uh, it has the backend folder and the frontend folder. So I'm not really in my app folder. So because we're designing the server, that means we're designing the backend. So we want to do CD backend. And then now we can run yarn start. Okay, looks like it's giving us another error. Let's see. Um, uh, const app express not defined. Oh, okay. I basically put an extra S at the top. Save that again. Run it. Okay, looks like it's another error. Mm. Oh my God, still? I thought I just, oh, oh, I think I, oh, okay. 
I tried to save it. I have a PC, so I tried to save it with Control S. But it's like, anyways, whatever. Okay, not again. Let's see. Hmm. Okay, unhandled. Okay, 8080, 8080 is already in use. So um, this is what it says here, right? So the reason it's saying that is because I have the cat thing here that um, I forgot to, to close. So it's closed now. And if we run your start one more time. Okay, there we go. See, the server's listening on port 8080. So everything's set up with Express now. So we can go ahead and, and kind of power through the um, actual endpoints here. Um, so we've kind of... Um, We've talked about the endpoints that we might use for a cat server, um, but let's think about what endpoints we might want to use for uh, uh, our actual kind of like Twitter clone so, uh, um, server. So um, what, might, what might we need to do uh, with a post uh, for this server? So what kind of endpoints might we need? There you go. Okay, yeah, that's something that we will add. But it's not, it's, uh, that's connected to the users more so than the posts. Um, so we will do that today, but um, uh, Eno is going to be doing that. Uh, what might we need for like the post specifically? So once you've already logged in. Eno mentioned one thing earlier. Somebody asked about the put versus post. What, what example did he give? Um, yeah, I think so post is external factor dependent. Um, but uh, there you go. Yeah, that's correct. And but specifically the example that Eno gave is liking a post. And he said that would be a, a put request. So that's one of the endpoints that we're going to need. Um, another one is going to be just getting all the posts so that we can kind of display them um, on the page. Uh, if we uh, switch back to the slides here. This is kind of what our front end looked like, if you guys recall. So uh, if we look at the right side there, we're going to need the ability to like a post, um, to add a new post. Um, uh, we're able to edit our posts, delete posts, and just view all of them, right? So like you can clearly view all. Of them. So those are the kind of five ones that we're going to be implementing. Um, so let's just take it one at a time. Um, let's talk about just viewing all the posts. What kind of endpoint might that have to be and why? on this slide here, so don't look there. Oh, shoot. It's okay. Yep, go ahead. Yes, why, why do you think it would be get? Yeah, exactly. Um, so that, that one is going to be a get request. Uh, so we can go just quickly go ahead and implement that. Um, so what we're going to want to do um, is at the bottom of the file, we can write app.get. So this is using express here, this app.get. Um, and it's basically, we just want to um, specify uh, the endpoint and then what to do when it gets to that, when it uh, receives a request to that endpoint. So this is going to be uh, slash uh, feed. And then um, here we have, to, we have to pass in a specific um, a function that has two parameters, a uh, request parameter and a, and a response parameter. And we're going to basically modify this, the res res here, so that it has the correct response. So it, the res is going to contain all of the posts once we're done with our function. And req contains the request. So in this case, um, there's nothing really of note there in the request. Um, but uh, it's there in case we need it, and we will need it for future uh, endpoints. So as the body here, or actually, there's one other thing I need to add here. Um, this should be an asynchronous function. A S C Y S Y N C. There we go. Okay. Um, so in the body, what we're going to want to do is make use of the um, the find function that Nathan mentioned last time. And sorry. So 
it will be something like this. So this first line is just basically saying, look at my co the collection that match matches the post schema and find all of the results. Like we're not filtering by anything. And then um, once we once we're done with that, uh, just plug it into feed. And then here we're just saying uh, store feed in my result with the JSON form. So essentially, this is all we need for to implement a get endpoint uh, because we're using Express. It's just it's literally just that easy. It's like three four lines. Uh, the syntax there there are kind of a lot of things going on, but um, it, it's just a couple of lines. So any questions on on the like this, this code here? Uh, it holds the request. So in this case, if we want to look at it, it would have um, probably this slash feed. It would say it's a get request, some other headers, um, and nothing else really too important. We're going to use it for the edit endpoint and the, um, some of the other ones. So yeah, yeah, hold on to that thought. Um, I'd also encourage you to do, if you add a console.log rec here, and you call the endpoint, it will print out what rec looks like. And it'll, it'll be pretty happy, it'll be pretty long. So um, if you're interested in learning more, that would be a way to find out. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and test this out. What we can do is basically add a new file in our backend folder, um, and we can call it um, any, we can really give it any name. I'm just gonna call it test. Um, but the key thing here is that if it needs to have a .oest extension, and this is going to basically tell VS Code to use that extension that we uh, just uh, installed. So once we've done that, um, we can uh, we can look over here and then copy over our um, request, which is going to be a GET request. So we can add GET, and then what would the endpoint be for this? What what I need to write after this? Okay, you're thinking along the right tracks. That's that's not specifically right. What is the actual kind of endpoint of this GET request? Let's look back at our server.js file. So this line here is us basically saying, look in model slash post for the schema of a post. So this is the line that we did last time. So this will basically say, oh yeah, post contains its name, the timestamp, the, the number of likes, whatever. This line here is the one that we added, saying, let me create a get request at this endpoint slash feed, and then this is what I'm going to do when I get a when I get a, a request that for. So this slash feed is what we're going to want to include next in our in our test request. Should we get slash test? Sorry, slash feed, what am I saying? Um, and then we need to in include the protocol here. So this part, um, we can just write down the HTTP one. And then the, the next line would be uh, host, and then localhost 8080. In this case, 8080, because 8080 is our port that we are um, listening on. Uh, let's see, hold on, something happened. Okay, I don't think we need to worry about that. Um, and this is all we're going to actually need here. Um, it looks like our server stopped running, so I'm just going to, or it may have stopped running. Let's actually try sending a request and see what happens. Okay, so uh, we basically wrote up our request, and just I just sent it. The send request button just appeared. Whoever asked that question? Is that what it says? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try uh, basically... Uh, ending the server and then running one more time. All right, great. So it's there. Or oh, it should be there. Um, hold on a second. Try one more time. Uh, it could be at the pound at the end of what, sorry? Oh, I don't. I don't think you do, but I can add it. Oh. Shift. Okay. Um. 
it looks like it's still waiting to send the request down here, which means that it's trying to connect, but it's it's so far been unable to. I I think it the the underlying cause, if we look at the error message here, is that it says it could not connect to any of the servers in the cluster. Oh, we need to add the IP address. Okay. Do you have it open here? Yeah. yeah so the UCLA Wi-Fi is pretty bad. Um. So there's this is issue known issue. Um. Okay. Yep. So we just added the IP address. So if you're getting this issue, do that. We just did. And then let's see down here. We're going to stop our server, run it. Okay. So it says our server is listening. Um, let's try sending the request now. Come on. You got to be kidding me. <laughs> okay. It says waiting, which means it's probably doing the same thing. Um, let's see. Do we need to try a different source, different internet source? Okay. Um, which one should I, you know, do you want to switch it? I think it's the edit function um, and that will reuse the body uh, so why might we need a request body when we're doing we're basically making an edit api call like if you wanted to edit the um a post how would you do that uh yeah so you could, you could make a request um, but I mean, like, if you want to physically go and, and edit the request, how would you do that? And let's just say I wrote down a post. Oh, sorry. Let me rephrase that. So let's just say I wrote down a post, right? I physically wrote down a post. And then now I want to edit that post. What would you need to do to edit that post? Yeah, exactly. So you have to erase it. And then you'd also have, what else would you have to do? Yeah, so you'd, you'd presumably you'd want to write something else. So if we kind of try to think about that in terms of our, our API model, we're sending a request to edit our post. Uh, so what would we need to know, what would the server need to know in order to actually edit that post? Well, we need to know which post we want to edit, right? That's one of the things. Because if we just send a request, like saying, hey, edit a post, it's, it's not going to know which post to edit unless we tell it exclusively. So that's one of the things that we're going to do. And then the second thing is um, it needs to know what the new body should be, what the new post should actually say. So we have to include both of those things in our request. Because otherwise, there's no way for the, for the um, a server to know. So um, let's see. So uh, I guess as a stepping stone to that, we're going to start with the, the new post uh, endpoint. Um, wait, actually, did we test this out? Let's see. OK, sending the, this request, we can see it does have a good body here. It has the 200 code, and the body is a post. Uh, this is the one uh, Nathan created last time. It just says some context in it. So we're going to double back to that edit post. We're going to basically work our way up there. So we're going to do the create a new post first. Um, and like we talked about, that would be a, a, a post request. I think you could get away with making, actually, in this case, hmm. I do think you want to go with a post request in this case. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. So we're going to quickly wrap, quickly uh, blaze through this endpoint. So it's going to be feed slash new. Um, so that's the place where it's going to listen. And then um, we need to pass in our same function. So uh, where is? Uh, where is the and then we have. Basically, the first line here is basically going to say, I'm creating my new post. So it should be const post equals new post. And then this post should basically look, look like whatever the request is telling me my post should look like. So it should be content uh, rec dot body dot content. And we'll talk about, I'll talk about what that body thing means in a second. 
But if you've been listening to what Eno said, uh, it should make sense. Or sh some of it should make sense. So we're going to do the same for user, and then timestamp is just going to be date dot now. Okay. And then we at the bottom here, after we've created our post, this this line here, or this four lines, basically just creates a local variable called post, right? So what we actually need to do is run post dot save. And this is a mongoose function. And so it's basically going to say, okay, so I, I have a new kind of instance of my schema, um, or that instance of a post that matches my schema. Let me save it. Like, let me actually save it. And then uh, at the bottom, we can do uh, res.json and then post. So if we switch back to our um, test.res file here, um, I added these three pound signs to basically split my, uh, separate my different requests. And we're just going to write post slash feed slash new. Host, local host, 8080. And then here's where the body thing comes in. So when we're creating a new post, we need to specify the user and what the post contains. So what we, the way we do that is by, by basically including a body uh, as a part of our request. So like Daniel mentioned, uh, requests and responses both have a head and a body. So the body is where we're gonna actually include the details and the head is basically just specifying where the request should go and then what it looks like. So um, this specific request body should basically say, uh, before, we, before we actually add the body, we need to add another line here. This will be content type, so specifying the format of the body. This will just be application slash JSON. And then the body itself will just be um, in. All right, everyone. Yeah, sorry about that. I think uh, Eno's laptop died. So we have to use kind of a, uh, we have to split it here. So just to kind of adjust you guys, this is my local uh, Visual Studio. The only difference is that theme is, is dark, so the code will look slightly different. Um, but I've gone ahead and uh, basically written up the same functions that we had last time. And then in the readme, uh, sorry, in the .rest file here, the test.rest, this should be in backend. Um, uh, we don't have the, the post request yet. So what we were talking about last time was trying to figure out what this request.body.content and request.body.user means. Um, essentially, uh, we realized that when we're creating a new request, we have to include the content of the request. So like, sorry, when we're creating a new post, we have to include um, the body of the post, so like what the post actually says, and like the username of like who's creating the post. Um, and we have to have some way to do that. So if you recall, when Eno was talking about um, the like a uh, general HTTP request, he mentioned that there was a header and there was a body. So that body is where we're going to choose to kind of include that information that uh, specifies the actual like post information and stuff like that. So to access that, we use the express syntax here. Um, the, uh, so, and specifically, we want to access the, the um, sorry, the rec um, kind of first parameter of this express function. Um, so we look at rec.body and then dot whatever the name of the field that we want to call. So what this means is in order to call this, let's first um, move into our backend folder. And then we can run your on start. All right, and just waiting for, um, okay, good. Looks like it's connected. So if we go back here, you have to add in these three pound signs to signify the end of the previous request um, in, in this kind of little document that we're creating. So this will be a post request this time. And the endpoint here is feed new, um, which is the, um, the endpoint that we just created for the, uh, creating a new endpoint. So I create a new post and then uh, specify the protocol here. And then we want to say host localhost 8080 again. Here's where our key difference is. We have to specify um, what the format of the request body will look like. So we're going to write um, maybe it is content type and then uh, application slash JSON. And all that's saying is, hey, my body is in the JSON format. And then um, you want to basically add an extra line and then put the body of the request. So um, like Eno mentioned again, uh, both requests and resp and um, responses have a header and a and a uh, body. So here we're just including the body. And if you look back at our server.js, you'll realize the fields we need are content and user. So let's go ahead and write content. We'll say my new push. And then user will be uh, myself. 
it. Okay, great. So now we can go ahead and try sending this request. And great, we see that it has the 200 OK status. Um, and <clears throat> it's basically shown us what our post looks like, uh, complete with the ID, the um, uh, number of likes initialized to zero, and the timestamp. Okay, great. So hopefully that clears up how we can kind of send a post, use a post request, and how we can access the body. The key here is that we were actually able to send information in our request, namely the content and the user, and uh, have it like affect our server and our database in some sort of persistent way. So the next point we're going to implement, and this is the, the last one we're going to go into the full cool detail with, will be the um, <coughs> sorry, the edit endpoint. And for this one, we're going to do something slightly different. So again, it's going to be a post request. Sorry, in this case, it's going to be a put request. Uh, um, because we're not creating a new resource, we're modifying an existing one. <clears throat> we want the endpoint to be feed slash edit slash, and then it'll be, um, uh, we'll have this kind of <clears throat> ID field at the end. And I'll discuss what that means in a second. But just think of this as like another endpoint, just at the edit kind of uh, uh, like end, I guess, domain. And then again, we're going to have to have this kind of express syntax function here. Um, that has those two parameters, the request and the result. And then um, we would implement the body here. So let's quickly talk about this here. All we're doing is saying um, in the endpoint, we're going to include another parameter. That's what this colon here means. And then this is the name that we're giving it, the underscore ID. So um, similarly to how we were able to access the body, we can also access these parameters. Um, we can also call it like a URL parameter because um, this is kind of the domain that it's searching at. Uh, at the, it's searching in the host for this kind of uh, uh, domain. So um, what we can do is write const post equals, um, like the first thing we need to do when we're editing a post is find the post that we want to edit. So to do that, we would use that same um, uh, the dot find function. But in this case, we're going to use it's like brother. We're going to use the find by ID. And then we need to specify the ID that we want to look for. So in this case, it would be that I underscore ID parameter. So we can access that by saying request dot params dot underscore ID. All right, and then before we move on, you'll see it's giving me a little error though. We hover over this, we can see <clears throat> it's complaining because I didn't make my function async. So I have to do that. And we should be good to go. So once we have our correct post that we want to modify, we have to actually modify it. So to do that, we're going to want to say post.content equals uh, rec.body.content. Uh, and then we can, um, again, this line here, just like with our new function, uh, it only modifies the local kind of variable of post. So we have to use the mongoose save function. This is basically just saying, hey, so I found post. I modified it locally. Now let me actually save it and write it to the database. And then we want to write. This is just saying, let me log it. Let me give it as the response so that people can, can see that I actually did it properly. All right, so I've gone ahead and copied over the other two functions that we need. The first one here is the delete function. So this one is basically just, uh, again, looking for the ID and then using another variant of that find by ID function to um, uh, use the parameter ID and then just delete it uh, from the database. Uh, this is provided by Mongoose again. Um, and then we're just uh, uh, returning the deleted entry so that they know it was deleted properly. And this function here is a um, another kind of endpoint, this one for liking. So we've used the put request because it's not creating a new resource, it's modifying an, exi modifying an existing one. Um, and to do this, we basically just find the entry, just like with our edit function. We increase the number of likes, and then we save it, and then uh, we uh, return the result as a JSON. We're formatting it with JSON so we can communicate over the internet. Okay, great. So um, what we'll see is the next two, uh, the next thing that we need to do is go ahead and implement our um, schema for our user. So I'm going to talk through this uh, just by quickly pasting this in here. Um, all we needed to do was basically declare uh, our, uh, the name that we want to use for the, for the model, for the schema, and then just declare a new schema. And then in the body here, uh, we're just saying the schema has a username and a password. And both of them are typed string and required. And then at the bottom, this is pretty important. We're exporting the schema that we just defined. Um, 
so that we can import it in a different file and basically say, hey, this is the schema for a collection. Use this when you're trying to kind of manipulate the database. Okay, great. And then if we look in our serial.js, next thing we'll want to do is add two more uh, functions. So just again, copying, uh, sorry, it looks like we have a couple more here. Um, we can paste these in. We can run through them quickly. This first one here just gets all the users. Um, again, using that find function. We have another one to create a new user, um, paralleling our create post, um, again with the body to kind of store the username and password. Uh, we have a delete user function here, um, again, parallel to the post, and then an edit, which again, uh, does is more or less identical, except swapping in the schema. Um, and what I mean by that is we have this user word here, and this, um, sorry, th yeah, this user here is basically supposed to reference the schema. And I realized I didn't include that line. Let's go ahead and add it. Let me see if it's in here. Okay, the line itself should be something along the lines of uh, what we did with the post up here. So if I copy this, paste it here, we want to basically say we're um, defining user to be this user um, file, that, the schema basically that's exported from this user.js file. So what it'll do is when I call this user.find, it'll say, hey, look, let me look at the schema and find everything that matches in the database. All right, great. So now that we have these functions, let's quickly look at the last function here, the login one. Um, looks like we have two more, actually. We can look at the login one first. So this one is basically just asking us to find a user in the database that has a username. Uh, and if we found one, that means we, we um, uh, so if we, di we didn't find one, meaning that the user doesn't exist, um, return that there was some sort of an error, um, like this. So it's returning that the error is is the string username doesn't exist, and then it's format, formatting that in the JSON format and then immediately ending. Alternatively, if it finds a user, it'll check if the user the password that the request, the login request has on the right here, matches the saved password. And then if so, it'll uh, uh, return it as a JSON. Otherwise, it'll say that the password didn't match. And a key thing that we'll note here is that you don't, never want to save your passwords like like we're going to do here. You never want to save them as plain text. You always want to kind of like basically do some sort of encryption. Um, uh, but for now, this is just for example, so we're going to run with this. Um, yeah, it looks like the last function here, the actual last one, is just creating a new user. So this is a post request that basically will um, try to see if we already have a user. Again, same logic, search for the username. If they found find one, if it's found one, that means that there already was one. And then it's going to create a new user and then save it. Create a new user locally using the schema and then save it and then return it. Okay, yeah, sorry about the confusion, everyone. Um, but uh, these are the kind of functions that you're gonna need and the intuition behind them. Um, but yeah, feel free to reference the um, the the, uh, the the textbook thing that we wrote up, the readme's, and the um, the actual kind of files for the for the code changes, um, and we'll all be available next session. So feel free to reach out.